are live. Welcome everyone to Innovation Hour with Edgar Papke, whichever direction he's on, and me, Jay Say. Um, and this is an interactive conversation about the design of what's possible. So Edgar, you're just talking about screen time. Uh, it reminded me yesterday was the first time down here in Louisiana we could get out and be active. So I went and played tennis, which I'm terrible at, but it's pretty good social distancing sport for the most part. So I played tennis with my friends and he hasn't been out of the house in two months. And it was so interesting to see how he interacted with me versus me. I have been around people safely, but I have been around people. So I don't have that desperate need to get that attention that I've been missing. And uh, he, one needed some vitamin D. He needed some sunlight desperately. He looked pale. It was awful. Um, and two, he also just needed to uh, have normal conversations. His view was so skewed. Um, any text he saw or anything was always seemingly about COVID. So he didn't want to hear anything about the virus. He was so overwhelmed, so anxious. And it's because his interpretation had been everyone was only talking about one thing while he was in isolation because he was only following one group message. And that was updates about <laughs> what everybody's job was like. So it just compounded how worried he was about the situation. So it was really funny to interact with him and see how, uh, how we moved back to being good buddies again. Like no more high fives, maybe fist bumps or elbow bumps, but even the little things, it was pretty entertaining. Yeah, the, the range of behavior and how people are interacting with each other is pretty interesting. And uh, of course, it goes back to what's your level of risk tolerance. <laughs> that yeah. simply, that's what we're talking about here is a lot to do with that. And um, also just you know, psychologically, what's the impact? Like, you're, like your friend and you looking for, looking for a change. And that's what's driving, I think, a lot of behavior is just yeah. wanting something different than what we've experienced, been experiencing for the past several weeks. It's pretty powerful. Yeah, and I know that will transition us into more business focus. Um, I know the way I'm interacting with my friend is one way, but the way businesses are interacting with their customers is another. So today we were going to talk about at least one topic, uh, talking with customers, right? <laughs> to put a broad umbrella on it. Um, I'm going to pass the ball to you. What? What's important about talking to customers? Where do we start? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's a great, that's a great part of the conversation because at the end of the day, that's what we're talking about in terms of how we innovate and all the new wonderful ideas that are coming to the forefront around uh, the COVID economy, COVID innovation. It seems like we're, we are, well, it not seems like we are as a society so focused on COVID uh, and what it represents both in terms of risk and fear and at the same time also what it represents in terms of innovation and new ideas and everything that's coming out of, out of it. I think one of the most important aspects of this is to keep an eye on the prize, so to speak, for business, and that is the customer experience. And mm -hmm. so we keep coming back to that. You know, the old, the simple idea that you could have a great product or service. If you don't have a customer, you don't have much of anything. So this always comes back to understanding and being uh, willing to talk to and collect data around the customer and what they're thinking, what they're feeling, because that's what's driving the behavior. And as a result of that, are they, what are they really interested in? And what is that, ex what can the experience of the future look like? So yes. one of the one of the data points that I came across this week that I thought was really interesting was a study done by Morning Consult. They reached out to over 2,200 adults, and you you we all know about what's happening at shopping malls, <laughs> and shopping malls were already struggling to begin with, uh, dealing with online uh, buying and uh, the whole online commerce, e-commerce, and what was happening in the brick and mortar world and the retail world as it already was being stressed and now this comes down on it and in a lot of ways it's kind of a reckoning when you take a look at the number of uh, companies that are either filing for bankruptcy or considering reorganizing under bankruptcy and so you see this happening 
But the interesting statistic that came out of the study of over 2,200 adults is that less, just under one out of four, 24 percent, mm -hmm. are saying that they would feel comfortable going back to a mall only after waiting six months. So we've got this window of six months, and you and just when you think about the idea of the impact of that, and then the other numbers are that 16% of those surveyed would be willing to go back to a mall waiting another three months. Still, we're oh. three to six months out in terms of just one out of four or less yeah. going back to shopping in a mall. And then the question is posed, well, how about a month from now? You know, if we, if we, if we lessen up on the, on, on the, uh, the restrictions that are in place, how do you feel about that? And it's it's only 4% would return. That's after waiting one more month. So this is pretty pretty telling in terms of how people are actually feeling and mm -hmm. what, the, what they're thinking about and also how they're changing their behavior accordingly. And you can see there's a, so much innovation taking place in terms of new product, new service. And uh, again, it all requires us to go out and reach out to customers. The, the other thing, the other thing that I think that's coming out of this is a lot of people are looking for the big hit. <laughs> you know, let's hit the <laughs> yeah. home run. I mean, let, let, let's kill it, right? Let's come up with this dynamite innovative product or service and just rattle, rattle the cages, rattle, rattle the market with, with something. And I, I think it's important to remember that most innovations are incremental. Uh, even with great startup and startup ideas, uh, whether it's uh, Amazon or, you know, the, back in the day around Facebook, and you, you just look at everything that's out there. Most of it is not the one, the one hit wonder. <laughs> it's yeah. not. And if it is a one hit wonder, that's problematic because that means that you're, you're relying on that overly. And it's really easy to fall into traps, especially now in cost cutting, mm -hmm. making sure that you're, doing uh, leaders of businesses or making sure that they get everything that they can uh, with what they have to work with, uh, forgetting that most of the innovation uh, that, that they can delve into is sitting right in front of them if they're willing to do it incrementally, which means you've got to talk to your customers. And you just can't rely. We've done a, such a wonderful job of using data. The reality is, is we still have to learn how to problem solve well by listening well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it it reminds me of something that I've always said to myself. I'm sure I read it somewhere. Uh, I'm sure I didn't come up with it. But um, the battle between effectiveness, efficiency, and experience. A lot of times I feel like people use data to try and make a product that's more efficient. So it does the job faster, but they don't focus on the experience of that job that it's getting done. Sometimes speeding things up isn't necessarily better. You miss a big step in the process that people really enjoyed, or um, you just kind of do away with the magic of the whole thing. I, I, some things can't be sped up like a, a line in Disney World, right? A line in Disney World is massive. Uh, instead of trying to just do away with lines altogether, they made lines enjoyable, right? So a lot of times in business, what you're going to have to do is not just focus on shortening the process but improving the experience and you're exactly right talking with the customer is is the starting point uh and it's something that i'm doing at my company right now but it's interesting to try and talk to people at this specific moment in time because in order to get say my customer's attention i feel like and maybe that's a feeling that i have but i get better results when i provide a value or an opportunity of value to them directly in order for them to give me information back. So I almost have to come with something in my pocket in order to get that feedback from customers. I know there's a lot of different ways to get customer feedback and you could make a fake website, you could just send out a survey or you could try and call them all up and just chat with them or just go to their, go to their front door if you're friends with them and talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. But you're exactly right, we need to find ways to get in front of our customers, whether it's on Zoom or any of those ways I mentioned before and really understand those needs. And you also mentioned the COVID economy and COVID opportunities. It's funny because um, this is a natural disaster, but I'm also listening to a podcast on the Exxon Valdez, 
which is a man-made disaster that we created 100% ourselves. But right. yeah. within a week or two of it happening, the whole city where, well, the small town where it, it was basically centered, they had a whole new economy. That economy went from fishing to thousands of people came in that were insurance adjusters, lawyers. They were people looking to help get uh, with cleanup, find a job there. Everything in between, basically disaster management, everything that comes along with it. And I think that's something we've seen going on with COVID as well. Um, everybody's making masks out of anything. Everybody's making hand sanitizers. I actually did stumble across a really, really cool website called covidinnovations.com. And I would 100% recommend it because it has like over 700 really cool innovations, whether it's like a, a mask that mimics uh, biology. So it like looks like an animal mask made out of like environmentally friendly stuff or here, I got a few written. Um, let's see, a Pokemon style. So for those people who played Game Boy, a Pokemon style app from Russia that is actually a career fair. So you design your character and you go around and you do little missions, but you also interact with real people and chat and try and get a job in this, in this video game. So uh, it was really interesting to see also because it showed you where most innovation was happening because it was, yeah. it was, it was sectioned off. So food, retail, and anything involving medical devices and equipment five to 10 times more innovation than any other section. Yeah, the health and fitness section. So you just hit on something and it's interesting because we haven't talked about this, you and I. One of my favorite websites over, <laughs> over I've been peeking into that one quite a bit of late, <laughs> just out of curiosity. And Dang. I find it to be so remarkably entertaining. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a, like watching a, 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 Good news. <laughs> yeah, it's like watching good news. It really like watching is. good news. It's highly entertaining, and it's got a lot of different ideas kicking around. I would suggest that uh, people that are in business uh, in any shape or form go and look at that site and yeah. take, a, take a look at it at a regular basis and peruse through it because there's a lot of good stuff. Mm -hmm. There's something else on that site that I find remarkably interesting. Uh, uh, um, powerful in terms of reminding us about business as a whole and the different ideas that come out of it. So the masks, right? It, it, by the way, on the site, if you're looking for the masks, I think they've got under fashion and apparel, right? So <laughs> you know, what are the different kinds of masks? And you could have a Pokemon mask. There's so many different variations on the theme showing up on, uh, and that's just, you know, the one, one idea, the singular idea of, of, mm -hmm. uh, of masks. The thing what I find uh, that's refreshing about it in a, in a wonderful way and in a powerful way is that it's so purpose driven. You know, if you look at this, if you go to the site, you'll find that it's about watching trends and it's also about purpose. And this right now, I think, is a key. It, it applies to customers and as well as employees and organizations. And that is we need to be focused on assuring our customers that we're creating solutions that are meaningful. Um, right now is not the time to throw a lot of, and I think we talked about this in the last couple of weeks already. Now is not the time to put put it something out that doesn't have real value. I think more right. than anything else, there's an increased consciousness uh, on the part of the customer, the consumer, that says, "I want value." Just like it's starting to show more and more in employees, uh, they're looking for solutions. They're looking. <coughs> For, for ways of being just like products and services are intended to be useful and solve a problem. And that goes back to, are we listening to our customers well enough to understand their, mm -hmm. their story? What's the story? What's the context that we're all in? Is it is somewhat of a shared context in terms of the environments that we're all in? The reality is that customers uh, experience the same context in different ways. And within that, then we find the possibilities for incremental innovations or ways of, of, of shifting our products and services to a place that's helpful. By the way, John, love, love the idea about uh, uh, when you have the customers do, you know, you see on, you, we see on television and news reports about long lines. Mm -hmm. What's interesting, those people are just standing there. Yes, and there is social distancing. I think if you think innovatively, there's ways that you can, much like 
Disney's strategy is about paying attention to you. At the end of the day, they're all about community and connectivity. And that's the, that's the experience, right? Which we can, take a, we can take a lesson from that because people will wait in long lines with Goofy and Happy and Cinderella and everybody's coming to say hello and make <laughs> them feel invited. And it doesn't take a lot to, feel, to, to, to have people feel invited, to feel included, to feel of significance by giving them some attention. And you can probably find out a lot about what's going on as they're moving in and out of the, the environments that now they're beginning to become more and more um, willing to engage. So I think there's so such wonderful opportunities here that we can glean from, from different success, success stories about how engage the customer and listen to the customer. It's a great example yeah. you brought up. Yeah, I mean, staying with the theme of lines, which I didn't know was a theme until right now, um, I have seen a lot of companies focusing on like doing away with queues. We like to call it standing <laughs> in, in a queue for some reason. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah focusing on queues. Um, <laughs> I've seen a lot of companies setting up a uh, reserve. It's like a website of reservations, but for things I would have never thought of reserving before. Uh, California, my space on the beach. I can reserve it ahead of time so that I have my area and I know where I'm going to be, right? That's happening in Spain as well. Reservations at grocery stores for entering. Uh, Trader Joe's is a big company. Um, the line down the street is all the way around another giant building and back behind the building here. They're going to start a reservation system so that no more lines. <laughs> but it takes away that magic that we were mentioning before. Uh, normally in Disney World, the magic is there's this, that anxiousness, that build up, that excitement of waiting in line uh, is a benefit for when you're riding it. It is not a benefit when you're going into a grocery store. <laughs> so obviously you got to focus on your customers again and understand what are they trying to get out of this experiment, out of this experience and is what I'm doing the best setup or are there alternatives that could increase their happiness and decrease their yeah. stress? Yeah, very good. And that second uh, part of that decreasing stress is, I think, an important, again, the context is different. So you can't really compare one yeah. with the other, even if the experience is very similar. And growing, going to a grocery store is different now than it was before. And there's markers on the floors and there's arrows yeah. and just that idea. And I think it's, it's, it's incredibly powerful. Once again, we, we need to be able to interpret uh, much more than just what data tells us. We need. I think it's a great idea to be talking to our customers uh, in whatever means and whatever we have available to us. I think it's also interesting that as uh, people are waiting in line, it seems like, and this is stark, and it's a stark reality of what's going on, that it seems like people are waiting in long lines, and they are, it seems like they're waiting in long lines in food bank lines in their cars, waiting mm -hmm. to pick up their boxes of groceries. We're talking about a time of need here. What's interesting right. to me is it seems like those people are, tr are being treated with greater respect and a higher level of friendliness and a higher level of service by volunteers in this truly stark environment than at the grocery store. And I don't want to take anything away from anyone, uh, any grocery food chain or mm -hmm. what, what everyone's doing and what they're trying to do their best at, I think is wonderful. I do get a sense that there's, there's a need for a greater level of both friendliness, uh, the ability to uh, be more concerning and uh, be more empathetic in terms of the experience that people are having and not just reserve that for when we're in truly, truly, we are all are in a shared difficult time. I think that as much as I can see in neighborhoods, how people are treating one another and the level of friendliness that's occurring, even as people are passing each other from across the street with masks on and saying hello to each other, I think uh, the same kind of, of just simple approach of that friendliness and, and kindness and uh, compassion uh, in day-to-day -day, um, interactions with customers is so meaningful and so powerful. Just like how it is we're currently treating employees matters a lot in terms of their loyalty and, and how they perceive us. Yeah, 
I mean, sadly, one of the great giants in that type of experience fell recently. I think there was Neiman Marcus went into bankruptcy over the last week, and they were famous for their approach. I mean, they were way ahead of the curve before a company like Zappos put customers first and gave them everything they wanted. I think uh, Zappos is a great example of focusing on customers and how you treat them. Uh, They celebrate the longest customer support call in history, right? Um, So they want you as a customer support representative, the the people in the call center, they want you to engage. They want you to understand the customers and also just talk with them and make them feel good. The longest call recorded by a customer uh, support representative over 10 hours, 10 hours, one single call. So that is, is what you're talking about is uh, online experience of buying is one thing, but then customer loyalty is another. If you talk to me and help me and just talk about life for 10 hours, you really must be interested in me and not in making money. And that's what Neiman Marcus's approach was. But unfortunately, uh, due to other factors like the concrete buildings, in-person retail going down, um, they didn't adjust to their customers' needs. They still treated their customers in a great way, but they didn't interact with them in the way they needed to. So people weren't buying online anymore. They quit listening to their customers. Treating them nice wasn't the step they needed also to move forward. So it's interesting. You have to do both. You have to treat people the way they need to be treated, but also give them what they need. The two things have to go in line. Yeah. Yeah, and there's something in this too that I think is an important element that uh, is is important to remember. And I think this applies in business to business in the supply chain, working with vendors and and mm-hmm. uh, if you're a vendor to a customer in business to business. And I think it's important that we don't let optimization uh, replace the the ability to innovate around the customer yes. experience. Guys, okay, so there's this. Uh, it's always a tension and always has been that we rely on what we know. And and we also have a tendency then to use data in a way to create efficiencies and optimization, as opposed to continuously listening and paying attention to the actual experience. And, and it shows up internally in cultures too. It does. Mm-hmm. So uh, if you look internally in organizations, that when you find yourself striving for greater and greater optimization and efficiency, you can actually Uh, hinder yourself in terms of being able to communicate at the level necessary to innovate. What what innovation is about is it begins with listening to one another, uh, that idea of empathy. And and we've, you and I, we've talked about this before, and it really does come back to this. And it happens internally as well. A lot of, a lot of people in, in organizations that are involved in what's going on behind the scenes of an organization seem to lose sight of the of what's actually happening at the at the customer level and so that reluctance then to open up and explore that also shows up internally in how people treat each other and how internally innovation can be hindered so while we strive for innovations to optimize and we use data for that for that purpose nothing takes the place of having a real conversation of listening to someone else's story to understand what their real needs are, what their needs and desires are, and to understand what their problems are that you're that you're seeking to solve, and uh, and because we have that tendency to lean so so much into that efficiency, we undermine our capability for the better, higher levels of innovation that occur through understanding what our experience is as human beings. Yeah, yeah I mean. I, from experience, have made the missteps of focusing too much on data. Now I I realize I can use data sort of like a a heat tracker. So um, it gives me a feel about where people are kind of focusing their attention. And and from there, I can get qualitative and really, really hone in on what that attention is about and why it's happening. And when I start asking those deeper questions, and I think one of the things you do great is always say, and tell me more about that. Um, I ask those type of questions and really don't come with a solution in my pocket. Just come with the need to understand. Um, I, I can't express that enough that if you always come promising a solution first, then they're only going to focus on what you have in your hands and not what they're looking to have. 
So it kind of skews what you're trying to do to one corner. That's not talking to your customer and listening. That's show and tell. And show and tell can inspire something with your customer, but a lot of times it just distracts them. Yeah. And you've got to be careful to walk that line and make sure you're not just feeding them the right answer. That's like investigators leading questions. It's so dangerous, especially well, right now. Yeah, so you spend you spend a lot of time in uh, in design work. So design thinking, problem solving. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you see then as as being the shortcoming of people in, that you're engaging. My sense of it is, at least from my own experience as well, some of the work that I do with groups is, um, is actually talking about what does the communication look like? What does great contextual inquiry look like? What's your experience of that? Well, my experience with it is I have definitely run into many people that um, are that solution and sharing show and tell type approach. So I try and flip that and only only ask people open ended questions and kind of try and feel around without doing any damage and leaving any hidden nuggets that I want them to find. But right now, I've I find it difficult right now. I mean, the first. 15, 20 minutes of any conversation. And I, this is in a 30 minute interview, 15 to 20 minutes are going to be dedicated to me understanding how they're handling this crisis. What have they been doing? How are they feeling and establishing a relationship just on a personal level, not thinking about business. And then that gives me a short window to try and understand what they're doing today in the area I'm trying to research. So on my end, I do lose time understanding the problem but i gain trust so for me this period is an odd period because i feel like i'm moving around a lot but making a lot less progress so with research a big portion of my research now is just building trust and then from there uh gaining understanding and trying to follow up and and being patient when before mm -hmm. people would be much more forthright with hey this is my problem i need you to solve it right now and just throw in their information at me. And now uh, it doesn't happen like that. I, they want me to understand them on a personal level and get that out of their way because it's like a veil that's constantly in front of their eyes and distracting them. So mm -hmm. once you can remove that veil, then you can get better understanding. And before it, that veil didn't exist, my humor would just pff, make everything disappear right away. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's hard to be empathetic uh, without, uh, I mean, it really is. It's hard to be empathetic without getting to know you and listening to who you are and what your experience is. Again, while the context for all of us has this broader send, you know, commonality to it around the, the, the COVID-19 experience, mm -hmm. at the same time, it's also very individual based on what somebody wants. So with that in mind, this idea of putting more time into building the relationship so that you can gain better insight seems to be quite quite valuable when you def you use the term trust so mm -hmm. a curiosity i have because trust can mean so many different things to different people it, it 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 does and so what do you find is being if you were to define it what what do you think the energy is or what's being established between you and someone that you would define as trust i think i i guess i establish trust or i define trust maybe in the a, a few different ways, but in this context, um, it's definitely just a willingness to be open all the time. And it's odd because before, I think whenever I spoke to someone, it started with business and then I had to dig my way to human so that we started off talking about their business problems. And throughout the conversation, I got to know them more and dig deeper into who they were as a, as a person. And now it's reversed. So now I start with who they are as a person and then dig deeper into their business needs. And so for me, long story short, for me, trust is the ability to have 100% open dialogue with, with no fear or expectations about the conversation. That's, that's kind of what I mean when I talk about trust between me and them during this conversation. Yeah, yeah that's pretty powerful. It is, because then it goes back to this, uh, how it is that we integrate different levels of trust and openness into, into our relationships, into our conversations, and how quickly can you establish that? And so there's that piece that says, for now, 
efficiency and optimizing our time isn't actually everything where right. before you want to jump right in let's let, let's start moving towards a solution almost immediately now there's this context that we're in yeah. where people are looking for something more significant whether it's a a trust in that you're going to hear me and you're actually listening to me and it's real that you are really interested and so there's that trust also that you're going to help me solve a problem. Yeah. The path to solving that problem is through being heard and the level of openness that exists in your dialogue, in the conversation that you're having with them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, moving on. I'm, I want to, I do want to bring up one topic that mm -hmm. isn't necessarily um, focused just on the trust we're mentioning now, but I really do think it's interesting how education's changing and what the future of education is. So I know we have 20 minutes left, so I'm going to force it in. I'm going <laughs> to bring it up, even though it's not with the flow. Um, you work at a university and have experience with it. Uh, and you've been telling the universities that they need to innovate for a while now. So I feel like maybe you saw this coming and saw the need for certain things to change. But yeah. I was wondering about where do you think higher education is going to go? And I mean, we know it's online, but I, what does that even look like? And what does a college campus even mean anymore? Yeah, that's, uh, I, I, I just think there's a whole lot of, there's a lot in that. Um, yeah. So I'll begin with the storyline going back four, five, six, seven, eight years ago. Uh, we, saw the, we saw these critical moments in higher ed occur. Uh, one of them was, um, when people started moving online to get their educations. Mm -hmm. And you began to see that education had two key elements to it. One was the meaning of the education and what am I going to learn? And the other one it was the transactional, the efficiency, the expediency, and uh, which of course then shows up in a lot of different elements of decision-making on behalf of students and parents of students as yeah. they were moving into higher ed. And that's one area. So that's in a, in a state of transition that has been coming for quite a while. And you could see it in the decline of enrollment in traditional or quote unquote traditional education in higher ed. So that's been coming for quite a while. And so there's been this increasing desire because it's about, at the end of the day, it is about revenue. It is, and the ability for uh, universities to be innovative as well and to be forward thinking in what they're doing. And so it's, uh, in some instances, the strategies felt uh, forced in terms of moving, moving courses online and, and doing more and more of that work. So I think in higher ed, there's been a shift that's been coming out of at higher ed for quite a while, and now it's really being accelerated through the current situation. And I think it's, it's much like a brand of, an orga, of any organization, of any product or service. You need to be able to understand your customer. So I'm using a lot of language around the idea of, of student success strategy, just like you'd have a customer success strategy. And you look at the student's experience and looking at it through that lens, you begin to open up to having much more dialogue in a conversational context with students get to get to know what their needs and wants are. And so I, I think that's gonna be more and more geared towards specific kinds of branding in the university setting. In other words, if somebody is looking and seeking more of a community aspect, mm -hmm. they're going to be drawn to those brands and universities that offer community. If you're looking more to accelerate from the standpoint of, of uh, higher ed, delivering to you great levels of competency and a diploma that really does uh, speak to your know-how, your skills, your knowledge, and, and what it is you're capable of. That's another segment. And I think there's also the segment around self-actualization and self-discovery that's coming more and more to the forefront. So I think that, I think that it's uh, what we're going to be seeing is a lot of um, distinctiveness and uh, around branding. Uh, it is a great term that's been adopted by some, it's been adopted by Regis University to mm -hmm. think about how distinctive are we in comparison to others. And I think there's just an, an incredible market out there for non-degreed 
education, higher ed, uh, skill-based, competency-based training and education that's out there that uh, that that market's being tapped into, and I think that's gonna that's gonna create quite a difference in the world as well. I don't think it's ever going to be go back to what it was, just like right. today's gonna be tomorrow's history. And uh, so I think we're gonna see a lot of innovation and continue to see a lot of different approaches to supporting what students want and what their definition of success is. It's been kind of an inward approach that that uh, higher ed has had for quite a while, in terms of saying, "Look, here we we know, and we're going to tell you," and it's been that way for a long time. Now I think it's more and more uh, th there's this awakening about this idea of that it always has been about the student, and we've got to be much more adaptive, and pay much better attention to what students are actually seeking and and how they're they're looking for it. Yeah. Now. That being said, here let, let's go down to some really basic stuff here. Right. And that's what's the experience of students in, in elementary education and in high school. Yeah. And how is that shifting and changing? Wow. I, I think one of the things that it, that it does, it reminds people how important teachers are. I've always yeah. been an, an advocate <laughs> for teachers. <laughs> and I, and uh, I, I couldn't advocate for them any stronger than I am now. I got to tell you that, uh, you know, now we realize how important teachers are in everyone's lives. You know, part of the fabric of society. Teachers are just, for the most part, amazing human beings. They really are in yeah. terms of their commitment, their dedication to what they do. And uh, right now, I think we've got to pay a lot of attention to their experience and uh, the integration of the student experience with the teacher experience. And then, of course, the parent experience. And I think listening to one another right now has a really powerful moment in time. I am very excited about what's going to come out of um, like elementary education all the way up to higher education, but focusing just on um, elementary. Uh, and yet, like you mentioned, teachers, incredibly important. Anyone who has a kid right now has probably completely changed if they weren't already in love with their teachers they are in love with them now because now they're working with their kids two feet away from them screaming and they don't know how they get <laughs> how a teacher gets their kid to focus at all so yes 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 to all of that the interesting things and I'll, maybe these are all crazy ideas but the things that i'm seeing i mean obviously private schools are going to have a hard time right now because of funding public schools are going to have a hard time right now because they're a little bit slower to shift and their ability to actually broadcast online, get their teachers updated, get all their students' equipment is just more difficult. Uh, but there is a gap with charter schools. And I bring this up because I read an article about New Orleans after the Katrina. And New Orleans is actually called the charter city because after Katrina, they went from all public schools to all charter schools. And the cool thing about that and how it relates to now is that at charter schools, anyone from any neighborhood can go to that school. So you could go to the best school in New Orleans, regardless of what neighborhood you live in. And that's kind of how I feel like these whole, this whole online experience has taught us if everyone's online, then the marketplace becomes different for a good education. You don't physically have to be there. So mm -hmm. it could be interesting to see if teachers become commodities uh, that say a school isn't just a single group of teachers, but teachers are a commodity that is hired for X amount of time by a school and they link up all these teachers to make a non-physical temporary school where they have the best teachers. So they get the best students and the students are from anywhere around the state or around the country. It's going to be an interesting way that the business model of these little elementary schools uh, could change. And to that, maybe the price point changes. I mean, uh, talking about colleges here in Louisiana, uh, our lovely Congress a few years ago did away with the bill that um, tuition could be upped whenever. So it went from 10 to 13,000 to 25 to 28,000 in a one year span with no added benefits, no added value, just a whole lot more money, right? So what's the value of an education when it's remote? If you're, there's two things I think people look for in college. One is a good education and two is coming of age, becoming an adult a good experience and learning about yourself. 
And mm -hmm. it's great when you get with people that are all your age. There's so much energy and you're learning about who you are as well as the skill set for a career. But if we take away the part that's the engaging with other people, learning about myself, and I just have the education left, man, that sure better be a lot cheaper than it is now. <laughs> or else people are going to find another way. So I think there, it's going to be really interesting because when you put all the market in one location, which is online, one factor is going to be price point. So I, I'm doing an MBA online that I found on Groupon for $224, a certified MBA program for $224. It's now, incredible, right? Yeah. That's, that's incredible. The value of the education is it's the same classes with the same teachers that they teach it for. I don't know how many times more it's like $15,000 in person. Uh, it's in Spain. So it's interesting to see. Now I'm taking an MBA course at $200 from another country. There's no way I'm going to be the only person to do that. So the future of education is going to shift so much as education becomes a global opportunity and not just a local resource. Yeah. Yeah, again, it, it, it goes back to what is it that the, you're the customer, you're the student, what's your definition of success, and then how does it fit into what the university or the school offers? Yeah, agreed. And so paying attention to that, I think right now is so, so important. And, you know, some people just, I just want the degree. I just want to be able to have that on my resume and have the degree. And then the other aspect of it is people that want to engage at a much deeper level. Uh, the social side of that. If we look at that being, and it, there's a difference between children and adults too, as we come into the adult world, we want more choice. So childhood learning is authority figure based. It's, it's kind of, look, you're told what you need to learn. And this is why you're going to go through the motions of learning it. And this is what it looks like. And then of course, there's the social design that goes with it. And so can you really separate the two for children? And what does that look like? As an adult, you can make your own choices because you can get your social fulfillment in different ways. And if I just want the degree, then that's all I'm looking for. And if it's, again, it goes, it goes to that idea of, is it about efficiency? Is it transactional? Right. Uh, or, is it, or is it that we innovate towards providing deeper needs and desires for people? That, and, and that's not to say having a degree is a deep desire for people. Uh, it isn't for everyone, and for some it is. And mm -hmm. so now we learn to get more specific, and we get we learn again the importance of listening and understanding. You know, if we're going to collect data, what is the data telling us, and what is the actual experience telling us, and and what's the value of that experience? And that's why I go back to what I mentioned before: is that it's it's going to be very interesting to see the different shapes and forms that come out of this. The easy way is just to say everything's going to go online. Heads up, that's the way it's going to be. Right. Now, if that were the case, then we wouldn't have such a broad span of of uh, choices that we have in just about any market that 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 we're in, including education. Mm -hmm. I do think it's important to come back to a couple of things that you mentioned that I think are worthwhile exploring further. First one is is going is is what's the experience of the student and if we just rely on online and uh, we don't have that same level of communal experience, of, of uh, social experience, we're going to start seeing drawbacks to that in, in, in just childhood development and social development as those children then become adults and what are they bringing with them into the adult world. I think that's a, a really vital piece of this. Another one is that uh, as we think about your... Um, uh, charter school comment. One of the things in my experience of actually being engaged in co-founding a school that was an alternative charter school is that community sense. And one of the things that happens there, and, and this is a key moment right now, how well do administrators in school systems listen to teachers? Are they telling teachers the way it ought to be? Or is this actually a real conversation about the potential of innovating what could be? Distinct mm. difference. One is, I'm going to tell you, this is the way we're going to model this. This is the solution we're going to. And are we really engaging teachers in creating the solutions that will matter most? And those that have the direct experience of working with the students and the parents. And so this is an important piece in the, in the moment of, uh, that we're in right now. 
just like in any business, how well are people listening to one another? And are we really going to those that know best and have the best information to be yeah. able to, help to innovate and create the solutions of the day? So I think it's a really important one. And what I find in the experience of charter schools is they are more community. They are, and that community sense of it also shows up in the construct of the culture and the relationship of administration and leaders to teachers, where every teacher feels like they're a leader and they are in their own classroom. They're also a leader as part of the community that they're in. So I think there's great lessons to learn from that. And mm -hmm. charter schools do just like we see my comment about what's the possibilities in higher ed is that you can see differentiation occur in different schools and different models and unique innovations that have occurred as a result of that. It's not the end all because one of the things that can happen is as we group and as we, and as we um, look at it systemically, we've also got to be sure to integrate and take the best of everything that's happening around us and making it available to everyone and using it. So higher levels of collaboration across schools and school systems is I think a, a true necessity as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we actually, we, we do have one question um, from the from the group. So I, I'll uh, summarize it because it's a, it's a lengthy one. Thanks for the question out there, uh, Travis. Um, so basically, Travis mentions that, I don't know if you can see the question. Let me click answer live. Um, so for a long time, our, our schools have remained the same in the structure and the way people have learned. And now with this pandemic, everything's changed and schools have gone virtual. I mean, we can think of that boxed in structured learning system as potentially stifling children's creativity. And now parents and learners have had to create new ways and adapt to this virtual world. So he wants to know if uh, in some ways we're glad that this di disruption happened, kind of forcing our way forward. Um, and if, let's see if I can break it down a little more. The, it's forced our parents and learners to demand change and for that change of virtual learning to widely be adapted. So I think Travis, yes, we, we were mentioning virtual learning and it being, um, extremely vital right now and helping people continue to educate their children. But Edgar, I do think you touched on some great points that moved away, not just from virtual learning is the only piece of the puzzle and the only solution, but for the meantime, for the, for the, I don't know, three to six month period. Yeah. Virtual education probably will be everything. And there will be solutions to a parent who needs, who doesn't know this skill set of teaching and need support, there definitely are gonna be tools that are popping up left and right. But as you mentioned before, that sense of community, I don't know how you balance um, academic learning and social learning online. I think that's gonna be an interest. Are those two separate courses? <laughs> well, yeah, we've done, a, we've done a great job actually in education over the years and especially in higher ed of, of creating no separations. Uh, well, the, the great weakness of people coming out of universities today at a secondary education, including at a high school, by the way. And this we know is a lack of critical thinking and problem solving skills, uh, which is why ideas like design thinking and innovative thinking and different processes and systemic ways of creating innovation in organizations is so necessary. It's because we're actually in a way providing the context for people to innovate, to solve problems and teaching them the skills once they enter the workforce. And even there, it's a struggle because we don't, uh, you know, there's certain, there's companies like SAP and Intuit and all these great companies, some of which are in the innovation by design book. But if you look at it, this is really about uh, taking and being able to develop emotional uh, capability, a problem solving capability, uh, not just knowledge or, you know, being able to pack and systemically get people to, to learn basic skills and math and science skills and knowledge. This is about application. And we know as human beings, unless we know ourselves, unless we have a level of awareness of how to use what's given to us, it, it's difficult. As well as part of that is being how it is that we lean into each other and rely on each other to solve problems and to innovate together. So I think that's a key fundamental aspect of this. 
there's something else too, and, and uh, thanks, Travis. Yeah, there's thank there's another piece of this that's really important. Sometimes what happens in disrupt disruption and social disruption is we meet, have an immediacy to seek the next anchor, and what yeah. we have a tendency to do is 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 use that one, and before we, we know it, we're already rigid again, and we're not looking outside of that at all the possibilities. So I think if you're going to um, really leverage disruption. I think it's important to remember that we just want, don't want to move into uh, being rigid about a solution without understanding uh, all the possibilities, because it's really easy to overcome our risks and our fears about our risks that we're engaged in by just wanting to, to, to grab it. And, and we've got to keep moving it forward. And that's good. Preach it, preach it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Travis. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because um, it, re it reminds me of, um, I applied for a job like a few years ago um, and I had to take all these tests and one of them was a logic test. I am terrible with numbers. I can handle shapes. I can't do numbers. I bombed the logic test. That was when I was already had my flight booked to fly to that country to meet in person after going through five interviews. Um, at no point did they measure my emotional intelligence. And we've been talking about this distance that's happening and learning online and what does that mean for your community and how you interact with other people. And I think all that plays into emotional intelligence and understanding. Yeah. And it's funny that this company was a good example. They are an innovative, they're an incredible company that is an innovation agency, in fact. So literally their job is to help people innovate better. Yet they were stuck in this old way of thinking that logic is the end all be all for, for actually creating innovative solutions. When understanding the customer, as we've been talking about pretty much the whole day, is the basis for the beginning point for finding any innovation. So yes, you have to be logical in your ability to create it, but in order to find it, you really need to have that emotional intelligence to understand. And yeah. I don't want our kids to be scarred from this, even though it's a short virtual period, um, maybe that's a gap that they never recover from. So the content that universities are teaching could also be an issue. Um, maybe they're outdated. I mean, I know a lot of people, I didn't know how to write a check correctly until I was like 24. Uh, so maybe there should have been a class on how to do some basics of finance, you know, but I wonder if this will make the gap even bigger or this will wake universities up to really, really honing in on those students and, and the content that make them better humans and not necessarily better test takers. Yeah. Well, the work that I'm, the work that I'm exploring now is that we are in this age of awareness and, uh, unless we under, have a greater and deeper sense uh, and understanding and awareness of our own human experience and who we are as human beings, as individual and collectively, we'll, uh, we'll keep hitting up against the same old problems. And I think there's another thing in what you just said about you know, virtual and temporary virtual. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we seek is predictability. And we still do not have a sense of when uh, this pandemic is going to get uh, you know, we're we're still pretty much at at, at the beginning mm -hmm. in terms of a period of time that this could take us through, and I think we need to be aware of how we're responding to that, and uh, not live in a place of denial. We have a wonderful capability as human beings to just uh, flat out live in a place of denial, yeah. despite everything and all the evidence right right before us, and uh, yeah, the fear has a the lens of bending reality and. Uh, <laughs> That, that, that fear, that, that, that'll take us uh, out of seeing what's really right in front of us and uh, really paying attention to it. Well, I hope we can uh, clear off those lenses and make sure we do see clearly, especially in this time. I mean, it's a rare opportunity for us that the whole world is, is suffering from a single problem. So again, I mean, the internet connected us, but a lot of times people are the worst on the internet. So it also separates us. This pandemic has definitely given us all a reason to connect again, not as countries, but as people. So I'm hoping the innovations that come out of it are all human focused and enhance our ability to be better to one another. So I know we're coming across on an hour. Are there any final remarks, thoughts, knowledge nuggets you want to add? 
Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's good for us to all be mindful, to not seek the divisiveness that fear can drive, and mm -hmm. rather look for the opportunities for connectivity and collaboration and um, really innovating together. And I think we've got to keep remembering that, whether it's a pursuit of a, a vaccine, whether it's a pursuit of uh, taking care of uh, education issues that we're going to now encounter, mm -hmm. taking care of our children. These, these are all opportunities to manifest higher degrees of awareness that leads to higher degrees of collaboration, cooperation, higher levels of innovation. Yeah. And I'm excited. Um, just for my final thoughts, I've got some notes that I wrote down before that I thought were pretty interesting during this kind of pandemic, things that you can apply to your life and your business. So um, testing ideas early. So betting on all those horses, but <laughs> making sure you only bet a dollar so you don't spend all your money, right? Uh, bias towards action. So really get things moving. Don't strategize so much that by the time you start your plan, it's it's already useless and you got to throw it away. Um, I say a flashlight in the darkness. I don't know if you've walked around uh, outside with a flashlight and seen how many cockroaches come out. Um, use this opportunity to find those cockroaches about yourself, about your company, and then make sure you kind of squash those so you don't have any issues. And last of all is your team finally has a, a unique purpose that everyone has in common if they didn't already and use that to lift all the ships, right? Use that as a tide to lift all ships. So drive towards that one purpose. And from the customer con contextual inquiry perspective, if you're in Alaska, what are you looking for with your flashlight then? <laughs> That's true. Giant mosquitoes. I've heard their mosquitoes are about this big. So <laughs> well, not that big. I'll tell you what, they, 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 they can smack you down. And they can smack you down. All right, Edgar. Well, uh, I guess this is us signing off. Thank you for yeah. listening whenever this might be. And we'll see you next week at Innovation Hour with Edgar and Jason. Talk okay. to you soon, Thanks Edgar. Thanks a lot, Jason.